Yesterday, Sierraji spoke about how even people who uh, don't have any education can understand the basic practice because of the way um, Mahasi Sierra developed verses that are easy for people to understand about how to practice. And one of them, the fundamental one that uh, Sierraji mentioned yesterday, is that only when we note in time, only when we observe in time, at the moment of arising, will we see nature true. So to observe at the moment of arising, this word uh, arising can include anything, anything that arises. It's a very general, <clears throat> general term. And at the moment, indicates that this observation has to be done at, in the present, right, right at the moment, not when the object has already gone by, not in the past, and not when something is yet, still yet to come. We have to observe what is happening right now and to expand on what Mahasi Sayadaw said, that when we note at the very moment of, ri of arising, we will see true nature. Um, at the moment of arising can mean any, any uh, experience, at whether they're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. All these things are a combination of mind and matter arising and as well as thinking, opening the eyes, closing the eyes, blinking the eyes, lifting, moving, placing. Everything that we do involves nama and rupa, mind and matter, occurring continuously. So this can't be denied. Just try. Try to say that, th that this isn't so. So these are really there. The mind and matter are really there and they arise due to causes. So the Buddha said to study yourself and that doesn't mean by thinking, not by reflecting on the past or not by extrapolating, not by oh, looking at something and then calculating what might be. What is definite is what is happening right in the present moment. So that's what we have to observe. The Buddhist teaching is very practical. And yesterday spoke, Sayadaji spoke about this. Yogis who listen carefully know, and all those yogis need to do is put the instructions into practice. So today, what Sayaroji would like to speak about is the Pali word, lakna, which means a mark or a sign or characteristic. And whatever is there, whatever is, has some identifying characteristic, identifying mark. And when one practices, this is something that we, one needs to know about in a practical way. So Sayadaji will speak about this in terms of theory and practice. Concerning lakana, or characteristics, or mark, there are three kinds. And one is sabhava lakana. The second is sankata lakana. And the third is Samanya Lakana. And these are talked about in the texts. Among these three, Sabhava Lakana 
is what is to be known about each bit of mind and matter, nama and rupa. Each type of mind and matter has its own, its own individual characteristic. And mind and matter arises and it stays there and then it goes away. It arises, there's a moment where it's there and then it goes away. So there's three parts, three points in time to everything that arises. Another way to say it is it's everything that arises has a start, a middle, and an end. So this is the nama and rupa that occur, mind and matter that occur due to causes have these three points in time. The start, beginning, start, middle, and end. And this is their compound characteristic or sankata lakana. And samanyat lakana is how these, how mind and matter are all the same. They arise and having arisen, they don't stay that way. They disappear immediately. So, and all physical things do this. All, all nama that arises due to causes does this. So, for example, the yogis, uh, the sound is reaching the yogi's ear. And it doesn't just stay there, it goes away. It arises and then it passes away. It changes. And the ear base too, as the sound strikes it, it changes too. So does hearing consciousness hearing contact and feeling. All these things change. They arise and then they pass away. So when we say that something arises then passes away, that means, in other words, it's born and then it dies right away. So if something is born and then continues to live, well, that's good. But what good is it if something is born and then just dies right away? So that is not good. Anything that behaves like that, arising and then dying immediately, is, cannot be counted as something good. We can't prevent things from arising. We can't prevent things that we don't want to have happen arise. We can't make things happen that we do want to have happen. There's no supreme being that can command things to be. And there's no, uh, no small self, small being inside of us that can cause things either. So if you look at the weather, for example, at one moment it's hot, the next moment it's cold. These elements are always changing. And the weather affects the skin, makes things dry up when it's hot. So within our body, what is different is that there is also a physicality that is due to karma, our past actions. So our mind and matter, we may want to prevent bad things from happening, but we can't. We, we may want to request good things to happen, but we can't do that. If the causes are there for something to happen, then it will happen. So the Buddha preached that there is no inherent self what we experience, there's, uh, there's no self to be found in it. And in India of the Buddha's day, the view of self 
was prevalent. The, the view of self was what most people believed, and the Buddha opposed this. He said that no one can select and make things occur. They can't make things not occur. They occur due to causes. And these characteristics of not being permanent, of arising and then passing away, of being impermanent, the characteristic of being unsatisfactory, and the characteristic of having no inherent self, but just being process, these characteristics spread throughout all mental and physical phenomena. So all mental and physical phenomena are the same in this regard, with regard to these last three characteristics. So again, there's the sabhava lekana, which is true nature, natural characteristic, individual characteristic, sankata lekana, which is the compound characteristic or conditioned characteristic, samanya lekana is the common characteristic that things have. And for the yogis, the first thing to know about is sabhava. That's, the, that's very important for the yogis to know sabhava. So there's individual characteristic, there's the compound characteristics, and the characteristic, common characteristics. So to explain how these three types of characteristic appear, when we put our attention on the abdomen and the, the rising occurs, after that, the falling. So when that happens, um, that is the element of vayodhatu. It has the characteristic of stiffness, tension, moving. And it's one of the four major elements that make up physical matter. And that's this stiffness, tension, movement is the individual characteristic of air. Hardness and softness is not the characteristic of air. Neither is flowing nor solidity. These are not the characteristics of the air element. Nor is heat or cold or warmth. What is the characteristic of air is stiffness, tension, movement. And other types of matter have their own characteristics. But this one type called air has the characteristics of stiffness, tension, and movement, not other characteristics. Non-living things have their own characteristics, too. So rising and falling is what we call it. But the experience is that stiffness occurs. It becomes stiff. And whether it's, and then it goes away. So whatever, um, no matter whose being this is happening in, this is what the air element does. It causes stiffness. So, the stiffness arises, it becomes tense, it goes away. And it's, we can see that it starts, it begins, it's there, and then we see that it goes away. It has these three, it has these three parts to it, a, a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. So this is the compound characteristic of things. 
whoever's being it happens in it has these the air element when it arises the rising when it arises has these three character these three points in time of starting having a middle and coming to an end so as we watch it we see that it starts and it, and, it, and then it comes to an end and everything in our experience does that it starts and then it comes to an end and this is the character characteristic of impermanence of not lasting so in us or in others this characteristic is common to the air element that occurs in us all the phenomena that occur in us all the phenomena that occur to others they arise and then they pass away so before uh, the rising and falling occurs it's not there and sorry this characteristic of arising and then passing away of impermanence was true of the rising and falling that just happened it's a, a true of the rising and falling that is happening now it's common to all the rising and falling that we experience so because it is common in pali pali this is called samanya it wasn't there before it arises and while we see it it goes away so when we see it end the knowledge that this is impermanent arises so all things have this characteristic so in this in this section seroji has described the natural characteristic or sabhava lakana the compound characteristic sankata lakana and the common characteristic samanya lakana this is how to distinguish them due to the in breath and the out breath the abdomen expands it collapses sorry i can't read this so uh, and when that happens there's stiffness it become the abdomen becomes stiff tense and then that disappears so to know this we have to have to observe at the very moment the abdomen rises that means the first thing to do is to put the mind on the abdomen so it's as though our job is to greet a very important visitor if we need to greet somebody a very important visitor then we have to meet that visitor where they arrive we have to go there and wait uh, before the visitor gets there because we don't want to keep the visitor waiting so this means too that we have to um, go to the place where the rising and falling happens which is the abdomen the the rising and falling occurs the abdomen becomes stiff tense there's movement so before that happens the mind has to be there the mind has to be at the abdomen in advance and when the breathing the the when one breathes in then the abdomen moves so the movement is there and to know it we add a label when we observe and seraji explained about the use of labels the other day using the analogy that when at the beginning of our studies we need to say the letters aloud we are, we're learning 
the letters of the alphabet and we need to say them aloud. Uh, we can't just look at the letters on the page with our mind. And even after learning how to read words, short sentences, we still read these aloud. Even long sentences, we sometimes have to read, read aloud before we're completely skilled. So uh, that is why we use labels. And when some yogis can't note completely well, then we use a label to get the mind to be together with the object. So one applies effort to know the nature of the, of the object and one aims. And when one's aim is accurate and the effort is just right, then sati will stick to the object. So with every, when, we, when one makes effort every time and the sati sticks each time one makes effort to observe the object, then samadhi, the collected mind, will arise. So we try to have these three occurring every single time the abdomen rises. We try to have these things occur every time the abdomen rises, every time the abdomen falls. The aiming, effort, and sati. So we try to have these three qualities there every, every moment. And the teachers say that <clears throat> um, we should try to stick with the object from the beginning to the end, not, <clears throat> not to let it out of our sight. So we have to be like a detective who's trying to keep track of someone, trying to not to let lose sight of them. We too have to keep sight of the object. So as soon as the object arises, we need to follow it closely. So that means as soon as there's the smallest start of the rising, from that moment until the very end, we need to keep our mind sticking to the object. And some yogis still don't understand about this, and they think that one has to note start, middle, end. One doesn't note in this way. The start, the middle, and the end are not to be noted. What is to be noted is the rising. But the rising has a start, a middle, and an end. And one needs to keep one's mind with the rising or the falling from the start, from the very start to the very end. That doesn't, but what we're trying to note is the rising. What we're trying to know is the qualities that are there, stiffness, tension, and movement. When we have to observe is from the very start to the very finish. So this is something that the yogis must understand. Observing like that at the moment of rising when there is art and effort to observe the object, then kosaja, or the disgusting quality of laziness, cannot arise. This quality of laziness is, is the mind that backs off, the mind um, where our energy is completely gone and the mind becomes like cold butter, completely unworkable. So when there's no ardent effort, then the mind retracts like this. And whenever there's a problem, instead of advancing, the mind can't go forward. It just becomes like cold butter. So then one has to heat up the mind so that it will become soft again. And one does this with art and effort. 
So one who has this quality of intense laziness is called kusita, a very lazy person. In a job that requires alertness, the lazy person is sluggish, doesn't apply effort. So one who has virya, who has art and effort, overcomes this quality of laziness, overcomes this quality of the cold, retracted mind. Each time one makes effort to observe the object, one gains another level of getting over this laziness. So this, the effort that we make to observe the object, virya, and this cold, retracted mind that backs off, these two are opposites. So this retracted mind, this is the quality of sloth. And with effort, it has no chance to arise when we make effort to observe the object. And so instead of the unwholesome mind led by the quality of sloth or laziness, the wholesome mind led by effort, ardent effort, virya, takes its place, takes the place of the unwholesome qualities. And when that happens, the mind is able to penetrate into the object. Or in other words, it's as though the mind rubs against the object. The contact is effective. And this is the quality of vichara. It's able to stay in contact with the object as though it's rubbing against it. Because of, it happens because of accurate aim. So when our aim is accurate enough, then the mind will de develop the quality of vichara, of, the mind, of rubbing against the object. So if one always applies aim and makes effort to observe the object, this quality of rubbing against the object co will come, will occur. If, if that quality doesn't develop, then we'll be in doubt. Is it the abdomen? Is it the rising? Is it the falling? One won't know for sure about the object. But when this quality is rub of rubbing is there, of contacting the object effectively, then when the mind contacts stiffness, rubs against stiffness, one will definitely know this is stiffness. When the mind contacts tension, one will know definitely this is tension. When the mind contacts movement, one will know definitely this is movement. So one becomes very definite about what the object is that is being observed. So for this to happen, one has to note with ardent effort and with accurate aim. And if we develop these two, these two qualities, effort and aiming, then the mind will rub against the object. So this is the yogi's job. Each in its own time, the rising, the falling, objects of observation are arising within our field of awareness. One has to push the mind so that it will reach the object. Our mind has to be active and alert, not sluggish, not gazing. The mind must always be alert, active, and ardent. This is not a task for thinkers. In a way, thinking, having the habit of thinking is like an addiction to opium. So one has to apply energy. First of all, the energy which pushes the mind to get to the object, the energy of effort. 
and one has to also have the energy of aiming so that the focus, the mind's focus, will be accurate. And if one has these two qualities, if there is energy, uh, the energy of effort, pushing the mind to the object, and the aim is accurate, then the mind will meet the object exactly. And this makes our seeing effective. Because of the accuracy of our aim, then sloth and torpor can't arise. This, uh, our aiming is the direct opposite of sloth and torpor. Accurate aim makes the mind fresh. So as one continues with the accurate aim, then when the mind contacts stiffness, tension, or movement, one will know these qualities as they are. These, one will be definite about the object because the mind is contacting the object accurately and therefore rubbing against it. So this is the quality of vichara. So because of applied effort and aim, accurate aiming, then one becomes definite about the object. And this is, one should observe so that this quality, that all these qualities develop, so that one becomes definite about the object. So in this uh, moment when the mind has the qualities of effort, accurate aim, the rubbing quality of vichara. At that moment, the mind is clean. And we have to create this mind one after another. And this is what is meant by bhavana. So in other languages besides Pali, uh, the translation may not express the translation of the word bhavana, which um, in English, is sometimes translated as mental development. But what bhavana means in practice is to create this clean mind and then to make it happen again, again and again, to multiply it. When one is doing an important task, it's good to have protection in advance because then disturbances don't come in. If our protection isn't good, if, our, if we have some protection but it's weak, then it doesn't do the job sufficiently, and that's not good. So only when protection is established continuously is it good. And so too, one has to always guard the mind. So to guard the mind, one uses mental effort to push the mind to the object because then the mind doesn't become retracted. And one uses aiming, accurate aim. So with these two, the mind becomes definite about the object and there's no doubt in our mind about what is being seen. If we don't apply these three qualities, but instead just gaze every second of the time, then in 60 seconds, we will be losing this bhavana mind, this clean mind. In 60, sorry, in 60 seconds, in one minute, we'll lose the bhavana mind 60 times. And in five minutes, we will lose this clean bhavana mind 300 times. In one hour of carelessness, we will lose this precious bhavana mind 3,600 times. So if we think about how much could be lost in a day, how many times this valuable bhavana mind will be lost so one should have the attitude that I have a responsibility not to lose the bhavana mind. 
And if, if we can have this attitude, then we will see special things happen within a very short time. So now there are, uh, this retreat is two months long and one fourth of it is over. There's three quarters left. And if one doesn't try to develop effort, aiming, effort and aiming, and then the mind that is definite about the object, if one doesn't make effort to do this in the next two weeks, then at the end of the next two weeks, it's better just to leave because uh, there's no point in continuing. But there's, there's promise, there is promise. And if people make effort, then this will be a very good situation. So Sayadawji wants to be, become closely related as your Dhamma relative. <laughs>